This week marks the 60th anniversary of the Freedom Riders who fought to desegregate the South. At 18, Charles Person became the youngest member, traveling from Washington to New Orleans in 1961. His new memoir, Buses Are A-Comin', details the bravery of these men and women instrumental in the battle for civil rights. And here's Michel Martin speaking to him about his message to young people who are continuing that struggle even today. This conversation is part of Exploring Hate, our ongoing series on racism, extremism, and anti-Semitism in America. Charles Person, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. How did you decide that you were going to apply to be a freedom writer? They must have had a very uh, intensive uh, recruitment process because on an application, and you know, if, especially if you were underage, you had to get your parents' permission. Uh, also, they evaluated not only your um, experience as a as a uh, freedom fighter, uh, but uh, other things, other intangibles. And the the reason I say that is that uh, they wanted to make sure that your background was such that nothing about you derogatory could be used not only against you, but against the movement. Uh, because then that would be a distraction. Uh, when you had arrested, well, they wanted it to be because you were protesting segregation, not because of something else that you may have done or said. But, but why did you want to go? It was an opportunity uh, to do something beyond Atlanta. Atlanta was just a local, and I knew we were successful there. But here was an opportunity that I could affect the greater region because we knew we were going to travel throughout the South. And we knew that, well, we had heard that Alabama and Mississippi was a whole lot worse than Georgia was. You were just 18. You were the youngest person who was selected for this first, these first two buses, the first 13 people to board two buses in Washington, D.C., with the goal of challenging the continued segregation of buses and trains and airplanes starting in May. At this point, it was already illegal but it was still being practiced. The route was to go through North Carolina, then to what, South Carolina, and then to Alabama and Mississippi. Like that was the, the plan, right? At what point did you realize it was gonna get bad? Things began to get worse for us when we got to South Carolina. And we had two incidences in uh, South Carolina where John Lewis had one and Albert Bigelow, where they were attacked. And uh, in another little town close by, Hank Thomas was was uh, arrested and uh, let out in the dead of night into a crowd when he was able to escape. So things had began to get tense. And we talked about it, that, you know, be prepared. Uh, and when we got to Atlanta, we had a nice talk with Dr. King, and he was warning us that he had heard that danger awaited us in Alabama. And he said, I, the word is that you guys will never get through Alabama. Mm -hmm. Now, we respected Dr. King, but, you know, we had we had a job to do. So the next day, which is Mother's Day, everything was wonderful until we got to the Georgia-Alabama line. And when we got there, a, a gentleman was getting off the bus. And what he says to me indicated that, hmm, things may get a little more difficult. And uh, basically he says to me, uh, and I see was always the first one as you get on the bus. And he says to me, he says, you have had it good here in Georgia, but you're in Alabama now. So, you know, that kind of perked my ears up. But then again, I said, well, hey, he's getting off the bus. Uh, but little did I know in a couple of hours, I would see him again in Birmingham. But that's the first indication that maybe something was afoot or something was awaiting us in Alabama. Did you have a sense of what you were facing? I mean, you've alluded to it, but did you have a sense of what was going to come? I think we our anticipation of, of violence towards us was basically they might yank you off a stool. They might squirt condiments on you. They might spit on you. Or they might even put a cigarette out on you. But that was about the extent of the dangers that we anticipated. Nothing would get on that, but we had no idea that the Klan had other things in mind. Mm -hmm. And what did they have in mind? 
they wanted to kill the Freedom Riders. And possibly if we had uh, travel at night, they probably would have. Uh, because people reported they had all sorts of weapons and some of them had had guns. And, uh, you know, when they uh, put the, uh, set the bus on fire uh, and the, what they were chanting uh, while the bus was burning, it's obvious uh, what they had in mind. Hmm. Many of them had just returned from church. This was Mother's Day which is a very unique day in, in, in American life. But uh, they uh, really were intent on doing uh, extreme damage to us. You know, they were, there were no reins on them. They had 15 minutes to do whatever they wanted to. And they took advantage of it. So the first bus got to, what was it, to Anniston, right? Yes. And then the first bus was firebombed, correct? Right. And then the second bus, what happened? You were on the second bus, and then what happened? Well, when we got to Anderson, uh, the bus station was closed, and which is kind of unusual for Mother's Day. And there were a, a, a small crowd milling around outside the door of the bus station. The bus driver gets off, and he talks to them, and gets back, and he says, I understand the Greyhound bus has been set afire, and they're taking the occupants to the hospital by the carloads. Now, we knew that our, our friends were on that bus, but not having the technology we have today, we had no idea how bad they may have been. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, even to this day, the thought of a fire on an enclosed area like that is just is, is frightening to me. Um, so that's my indication of what had happened to the other bus, and also we, had, we heard sirens. But anyway, uh, after they gave us an opportunity to resegregate ourselves, and when we refused to move to the back of the bus, that's when the Klansmen got on the bus and, and uh, physically uh, forced us to the back of the bus. And one eyewitness says that they stacked us like pancakes. You knew that you were there to stand your ground and not to move from your seat. But when they're coming at you and you know that the Klansmen are there and you know what they're there to do, do you remember what that was like? Well, <laughs> I know that I should have been afraid, uh, but I wasn't, and I don't understand why. I didn't feel any pain from the punches that they threw. I mean, uh, I don't understand that. Uh, I just knew that uh, I had to remain nonviolent. I knew that I was not supposed to try to block their punches or their kicks or anything like that. Um, we were determined uh, to be nonviolent regardless of what happened. Um, yeah, like I say, if you could, I could never imagine generating that much hate from people who didn't know who me, who had never seen me before. How could they become so angry to the point that they would do the things that they did? Hmm. Simply because I was sitting in the front of the bus. You know, we're we're kind of in a moment where you know people get annoyed when a story that centers black people that focuses on the black experience somehow turns to the experience you know of white folks but the fact is that these white folks did put their lives on the line along with you and i just wondered if you would talk a little bit about that i'm thinking about dr bergman dr walter bergman first of all like how did you feel when you saw that like a white person was going to sit on the bus next to you i don't even know if that had ever happened before yeah. and what what went through your mind and why do you think they were there was one of the questions I asked him. I all of them, I was trying to figure out why are these white people helping here? Because in the Atlanta movement, we didn't have many whites to uh, participate. And uh, Dr. Bergman and his wife, Francis, said they told me that we we're going to take care of you. Uh, and they tried. When we were attacked on the bus in Anderson, Dr. Bergman came to help, help us. And they knocked him to the floor of the bus and they began to stomp him in his chest. And uh, had his wife not, in, you know, begged them, they probably would have killed him on the bus. Then when we got to Birmingham, uh, James Peck and I, we were the designated testers. And so when we went into the, the station in Birmingham, uh, at the entire wall of men came towards us and they uh, attacked James and he went down almost immediately. And I was younger, I was able to maintain my balance. 
But what we didn't know at the time, Dr. Bourbon was headed over to the, the terminal to try to help us, and he was knocked down. And Dr. Bergman is 61 years of age, and here he is crawling on his hands and knees trying to, to help us. You know, he didn't have to be there in the first place. Uh, and I, I can never forget, and you know, to me, then 61 was seemed like a, a very old man. It doesn't seem like an old man today, but uh, you know, to think that from in comparison of my age to his, and to see him on his hands and knees crawling and trying to help this black kid, and it's, you know, it was just, it's beyond imagination. You talk about in the book, and this is, this is a really painful part of it, is that you talked about them streaming aboard the bus. You talked about them sort of punching you in the face, grabbing your tie, your fist, and, you know, punching you in the face and throwing you and Herman to the back of the bus. But one of the points that you make is that half of them really focused on your two white colleagues, Jim and Walter. You said two Klansmen held Jim's head in their hands and delivered hit after hit. Here's what you said. You said, I'd never been punched in my face, but as violent as that was, the men amplified their fury even more toward these two white men who, in the view of our attackers, were betraying white values. What does that mean? Do, do you, how do you even think about something like that? Uh, they didn't like what we were doing but to think that whites would support our cause, that they would, uh, their fury would be increased even more. So that's what I guess the intensity of their hate and the, and the words they use to describe Dr. Bergman and, and James Peck. Uh, you know, it's, it's just that uh, they hated us, but I think they hated them even worse because they, they felt that they, they were being betrayed. You know what I found really shocking in, in, is that you drove off, you were in shock, most of you had been beaten bloody. Several of you were unconscious at that point. There were three black doctors in Birmingham. None of them would treat you. Why? Well, I later learned that uh, uh, medical doctors are licensed by the state. And then I guess we were called outside agitators. And they didn't want to be associated with these outside agitators and possibly lose their licenses. Uh, and I never uh, talked to any of the doctors since then, uh, but uh, I understand now. But uh, thank God there was a, a nurse uh, in Reverend Shuttlesworth congregation who did provide some medical treatment for me. Hmm. How did you get out of there? You know, uh, faith is a wonderful thing. Uh, there was a photographer there, and he snapped a picture. And when the flash went off, and uh, it startled them. And if you see the picture, they all look up at the cameraman. They simply let me go and they attacked the cameraman. Uh, they beat him up. They destroyed his camera and they thought it was a film pack camera. And they mm -hmm. thought they had destroyed all the film pack. But one image, and to this day, there's only one image out of Birmingham. And that's the image of me being beaten. Uh, mm -hmm. But they let me go and I simply walked away. I didn't run. I didn't cover up. I just walked out to the street, and, and then as fate would have it, a bus, city bus came by, and I got on the bus, and asked the driver to take me somewhere. It is remarkable, as we said, that yours was the first ride, but rides came for months. Some 400 people eventually participated in these rides. It went on from May, as you said, it started, you know, on Mother's Day and lasted through November until finally it was determined that the government was in fact going to enforce the law as it was written. Was it worth it? Yes. Yes, I'd do it again. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know, you have to realize there are a lot of good people in this world. Uh, and um, I guess that's what keeps me going. You know, I, I'm optimistic. I was optimistic then and I'm optimistic today. I see you're wearing your service medals. So I do want to thank you for your service in that realm, as well as the one that we're focusing on. You made significant physical sacrifices in the service of this country. And I know that many have expressed their appreciation, as do I. But I do have to ask, you: do you ever think about that? Like, do you, 
the irony of it, that you have been so willing to put your body on the line in the service of the country when it hasn't at times offered you the dignity uh, and the equality and the opportunity that you deserve. Well, what I try to relate to people is this, that um, when you look at your parents and you see how hard they work for you and you know that it has to be something that's better and, and you'll do anything. You know, uh, they gave you all the love and uh, most of this that you have to make provide for comfort for you and your brothers and your siblings. And uh, it's, it's, I think now, how did they endure that stuff that they had to put up with? And they worked on jobs and they were there every day and their pay was insufficient. Not because they didn't have the ability, it's simply because the system says, this is what they are worth. This is what, and it was just in my family. Most black men were in the same situation. I mean, it didn't matter what your skills were, and they built a lot of these companies. I mean, they were there because they knew they needed something to keep their family going. But in spite of two jobs, my dad also did side work wherever he could get it to keep going. And that's why I think he died so early, because he was just worn out. You just can't do that. Just year after year after year. Mm -hmm. Do you have some advice, or I don't know if you'd feel so bold as to offer advice to the generation of activists that are now in the forefront? I'm thinking about the Black Lives Matter movement, for example. Many of the folks who are at the forefront of this movement are the age that you were when you got on that bus. Do you think, based on your experience, is there some advice that you would share? Well, first of all, I don't think it's my position to tell them how to conduct their march. I appreciate what they're doing. All I would say to them is stay nonviolent, stay informed, keep your community informed about what you're doing. Uh, they need to know why you're marching. Uh, and you have to repeat it because if you don't uh, create your own narratives, other people will. Just keep your impatience. That's what happens. That's, we need that. Old people become content with the things as they are. Or we rationalize them. But young people are impatient and they want to see change. And as long as we got that out there and in, in, uh, that kind of enthusiasm in our young people, we're going to be all right. Charles Person, thank you so much for talking with us today. It is truly an honor to spend this time with you. The pleasure has been mine. And thanks for caring. <laughs>